Transnational Literature, The Last Whale by Danielle Claude. Lone-handed, George Davidson, a 70-year-old master whaler, attacked and killed a humpback whale at Twofold Bay. The veteran whaler worked from a small dinghy and used only a lance. Yargis, 12, 12 November 1936. A dark shape lulls out into the out in the bay. A seal, perhaps, catching the last warmth of the winter sun, flippers skyward, head down, looking like an old box washed out to sea. From a seat in the outhouse up the ridge, the old man can see right across Twofold Bay. On a clear day, he can see the white caps break over Moosestone Rock. Random patches of foam cling to the surface for a breath or two before subsiding into blue. Even now, he can spot the patches that fracture the surface in close succession, those that linger longer than they should, that surge in troughs rather than peaks, suggesting a source from beneath rather than above. Fish, dolphins, whales, seal, seals, sharks, their signatures written on the water for those who can read them. The shape rolls into view again. Not a seal, too dark, too large. He watches as it drifts closer, appearing and disappearing in the traps of the swell. His trousers slump into ancient boots and he leans forward onto dry, wrinkled knees to look out of the open door of the outhouse. Old man's knees. Parchment skin stretched across bone and sinew. All this elasticity sucked dry by years at sea. Hairless shins are worn bare by the daily friction of gum boots. Blotched brown hands rest on pale, thin thighs. Winter air fans the smell of, sea of seaweed around his bare behind, mingling with the dark warmth from the drop. He rips a square of newspaper off the hook beside him. A wave breaks, black rolls over white. A distinctive triangle slaps limply against the water. It is Tom. The waves cuff the old killer whale's fin back and forth as if trying to re reanimate his lifeless body. His fin smacks the water like a comic reenactment of the many times he had flop-tailed in the bay, waking the whalers with a mighty crash of his tail, calling them to action. Rusho! They'd all cry, leaping clumsily from their beds, falling over each other into the boats. Come on, Tom, come on, Tom would call with another crash of its tail. Get a move on. He watches a fishing boat trail its wake across a bay, heading back to port. Sometimes he'll join the fishermen at the hotel, listening to their stories, their bragging and laughter. Old Fearless, they called him, as he sits with his lemon squash. The fishermen never brave the southern gales in their overpowered trawlers. Only whalers go out in the winter, rowing their open gigs, six men to a boat, hunting humpbacks, right whales, and 90-foot blues. But that was long ago. There are no more whales now, no more whalers. Only old Fearless, sitting on the ridge, still scanning for the telltale slice of white, the hissing fan of a blowhole to mark the start of the season. The body in the bay rolls again, fins slapping the water. Come on, calls Tom. The old whaler heads back down the path to the house. His knee doesn't bend anymore. A whale broke it. A whale could cure it if there was a whale to be had. But there is no more whale oil to soak aching limbs. No more hot, greasy carcasses to slide into. Straight leg down the, straight leg first down the hill. He pivots over the steps. Bending is overrated. The path leads down to the cottage behind the ridge, overlooking the inlet, which meters its tea-stained waters across a ripple of sandbanks into the bay. A dark snake of water marks the narrow channel where the whale boats once towed their prizes into sheltered waters and dragged them up onto the beach. The bones of the giant blanched on the beach where the carcasses were, were flensed and boiled, rendered and reduced down to a few barrels of precious oil. He can still smell the, st the acrid stench even after all these years. Past the triworks, derelict and unused. The huts were where the crews lived um, 
The huts where the crews lived crumbled back into earth. Once there had been a village there filled with men, wives, and children. They've all gone up and left when the whale stopped coming. The whale boat lies on its side, exposed ribs gaping at the elements, green paint flaking, flaking onto white sand. Too big for one man. It will lie here until it rots away like all the other relics. Gradually doing less, using less, making do with less until finally there is nothing left but a pile of old bones. He upends the dinghy, retrieving the oars from underneath and dragging it down to the water. The sturdy little boat bobs under his weight, sliding into the smooth rhythm of the oars as they pass from the sheltered inlet over the sandbar onto the choppy waters of the bay. Waves slap steadily against the hull as the boat pushes through them. He watches the water change from pale green over shadow sand, over shallow sand past dark smudges of rock into deep weedy blue. Here, it was exactly here, unmarked and unforgotten that his son's body was found 13 years ago. He holds his breath as he passes, or is dripping and lets himself drift for a moment. It had been a fine day. They had crossed that bar a thousand times, but the tide was on the turn, making the crossing more treacherous than usual. The wind had picked up a, picked up a chop and the current must have caught the dinghy as it crossed the bar, just enough to tip in a breaking wave. The wind blew the cries of the children across the water, the shouting of men as they rushed to shore, dragging bodies from the surf. All but one, his dark head, uh, all but one, his dark head bobbed in the waves, trying to right the boat, holding a child afloat, and then he was gone. It was Tom who found the body the next day. He had seen Tom circling insistently, guiding the boats back, nudging at pale limbs and dark and dark weeds. He followed the black bulk of the killer whale, diving into diving into untangle his son. He floated in between in a green world where his boy stared back at him. He wanted to drift with him out to sea, unbreathing, unseeing. He didn't want to surface. He didn't want to suck in that painful, grieving breath. It was Tom who forced them both up, pushing them back to the surface, pushing him back and back to the air. Tom had always been there to save him. Tom had dragged him by, up by the seat of his pants when he'd gone over tangled in a line. Tom stood between the men and the sharks whenever a boat capsized. It wasn't anything special. They were family, that's all. When a killer, when a whaler dies, the black fellow said, his spirit goes into a killer whale. But no young killer whale ever came to replace his son. Less than a breath and less than a breath and the moment passes. The oars resume their steady rhythm, the water slapping once more against the hull. The swell had brought bodies to, um, Tom's body closer to him. He digs his oar in deep, spinning the dinghy to come alongside. He strokes the black skin, still gleaming smooth and glossy. Tom's mouth hangs ajar. The ivory spikes that once slashed 90-foot monsters worn to yellowed stubs of decay and raw gums. Tom was the only one who stayed. Who knows where the others went? A stranger, hooky, humpy, and the rest of the pod? Maybe the pickings were better up the coast. They'd worked together for over 50 years and with his father and grandson before that. But then the killers left. Only Tom came back every year a bit older and a bit slower. Now he's come to die. The old man tosses a rope around the great tail, lashing it to the stern cleat. He digs his oars in short and short and sharp, feeling them bite against the heavy weight. So he picks up speed. Eddie's slipping around the streamlined body behind him, even in, even in death, aligning itself to the flow and sliding effortlessly through the water. Next morning, he sits on his customary seat, looking out over the bay. Voices drift across the calm water as if they were just downhill instead of five miles away. Right whale weather. weather. Right whales are the best whales, slow, placid, and easy to kill. Not like finbacks, angry things that thrash and fought like the very devil. Right whales, fin whales, blues, and humpbacks. He'd hunted them all. He thinks of Tom, the times he mucked about and teased the whalers, towing them out to sea, splashing them in their boats. The times he annoyed them, leaving them wet and shouting. 
He thinks of the whales Tom has caught him. The whales Tom had lo has lost him. No more whales for Tom. He wonders what to do with the body. He could drag it out to sea, weigh it down, watch it sink, it, watch it sink into the depths. It's how he'd like to go when his own time comes. No fuss, no funeral, no speeches. His daughter doesn't agree. Funerals are for the living dad, not the dead, she says. She's right. He won't care when he's, he won't care when he's dead any more than, than old Tom. There is no one left to mourn old Tom. No one remembers him. He picks a, pit, a bit of bacon from between the gap in his teeth. There had been nothing in Tom's stomach when he'd slid the flinty knife through his flesh. A plume of spray catches his eye far out into the bay. His eyes lock into shifting water, tracking an invisible path left and right. There it is again, the round, wise plume of a humpback. A long white flipper extends out of the water. He stands, tense, watching. Who could crew? His mind flicks over the fisherman, his children off the city, off in the city. There's no one left, just old fearless. He races down the hill three steps at a time. At a time. His breath comes short and sharp as the dinghy surges across the bay toward the whale. He doesn't want to lose it. The miles trickle past beneath the boat. Good thing it's calm. A mile off and he'd ease and a mile off and he finally eases the pace. Easy does it, easy now, he murmurs. He lets the dinghy drift in closer, easing the oars back, barely slip ripping the surface. As he waits, he coils the rope in the tub amid um, in the tub amidships, attaches the harpoon and checks the lance. The sun is high overhead now, even in win even in winter it warms him through his shirt. If only he had rowers and a harpooner with himself as the headsman. Should have brought the uh, boat gun or the whale bomb, but the force would probably capsize the dinghy. Other whalers worked with five or six boats. He had only, he only had it two. Two boats and the killers. He wishes Tom was here and the other killers, heading the whale off, keeping its head up, clamping onto his flippers and lips. But today there was only one old man in a dinghy. The whale surfaces to starboard, heading east out of the bay. Quickly, he rows ahead, jumping the time for the whale will stay, judging the time the whale will stay underwater, where it will resurface. Eight minutes, six minutes, four, two. The oars racket back and forth in the row locks. He twists around, feet braced apart to keep the dinghy stable, hefting the barbed harpoon in his right hand over his shoulder and balancing the long, smooth shaft with his left. One minute. Pale eyes focus on the point where the whale will return. His pupils shrink against the glare. He surges beneath the oily reflections, motionless as a heron, sifting through the light and shade for darkness, um, for darkness beneath. A shadow expands across the surface. The whale breaches, expelling steamy breaths as if it were pursue, uh, through pursed lips. The pungent smell of deposing flotsam hangs in the air between them. He hurls a harpoon into the humpback's neck, just behind the blowhole. Rope rattles from the tub, um, arching its trajectory across the sky, the metal bar burying itself deep in the whale's flesh. With a groan, the whale rolls away, sinking deep underwater. Its tail erupts into the air, smashing down inches from the dinghy. He drops to a squat, grabbing the, hand, or grabbing the sides. The hand of God, they call the whale's tail, smashing the boats from on high, but God does not want him yet. He can hear the whales cry through the water, through the boat, echoing first on one side and up the, uh, and then up and under the other. A long wailing sigh that you'd feel in your bones. There's nothing so sad in all the world as the cry of a dying humpback. He watches the, he watches the flicking rope uncoil in front of him, careful to avoid any loops as it snakes into the water. He has hundreds of fathoms of rope, the whale will take all that and more if he lets it. He sits up and begins to row again, chasing the trailing rope. The whale is headed out to bay. It has dived, but not too deep. It will have to come up for water soon. Up ahead, the whale surfaces, firing quickly, quick short breaths into the, into the air, red and seamy with blood, chimney on fire, it's fatally wounded. Even so, it could take days to die, slashed and harried by sharks to the end. He's not close enough to strike the final blow, though. The headsman shot the lance that will put it out of his misery. He rose on with renewed strength, hoping to outpace it, hoping it would slow it down. 
The sun is falling. He'll lose her in the dark. Adrenaline drives him faster than he expects, or perhaps the whale has slowed. It rises beneath the boat. He senses it coming and throws himself to starboard, hoping to tip the dinghy enough to one side to avoid capsize. The water lifts the boat above the rising mass. As the whale breaches, he slides downhill off its back, the stern gouging into the water before bouncing back to the surface. An oar, an oar jars free from its rowlock, sliding away from the boat. Cursing, he checks the lance. Cursing, he checks the lance's sill and bow. The rubber blade, the the blubber spade, and spare har- harpoons still where he tucked them under the under the thwarts. Waves surge out from the whale's descent, tipping and pitching the boat and pushing the oar for, further away. Waiting until the water settles, he paddles his remaining oar to retrieve the pair. He'll have to row fast now to catch up. His breath shortens as he pushes through the weeds at the bottom of the lo- pushes through the weeds at the bottom of his lungs. Water sloshes heavily in the bilge. The ache in his leg has returned. What was it his daughter called him? Old fool? A man would have to be a fool to be a whaler. It is what he is, a whaler, like the killer whales. He'd seen old Tom chasing a, a, gray, a grampus a few days before his death. Whale killer to the last. And now he was the last of the twofold bay whale killers. Old fearless, hunting one last whale on his own. He sees the rope drifting to the stern and pulls it in, flaking into the tub, flaking it into the tub. The whale must be milling below. He picks up the lance, a long straight blade. The whale barely makes a ripple as it rises to the surface, exhausted. His breath erratic now. He scans from blowhole to fin, a good 40 foot. His eyes fix on the fatal point between its ribs, three feet from the knuckle bone of the flipper. Here lies the heart, a beating mass too large for one man to lift. Arteries so big a dog could crawl inside. He knows just how much blood pumps through those veins. It has stained the water black for a mile behind them. With one swift stab, the lance plunges the lance plunges in. The whale shudders, a great spasm that breaks from surrounding the water into quivering tessellations. He feels it through his arms, the water and the boat. It envelops him, filling him with a shadowy presence before dispersing like a handful of sand in the water. All is still. The silence seems much bigger than it should, like something has vanished so quickly you can't even remember what it was. He hastily secures the whale before it sinks. It is too big to tow home. He'll have to ask Logan to come out in the launch and bring it in later. He watches as the body drifts open, ropes taking up the slack out of, out of the darkness, the glass boys bobbing as, as they take the weight. So little air to hold such a heavy load. The row home takes forever. His hands blister between calluses. How quickly they get soft. A dark stain soaks his trousers. He rolls them up, revealing the mottled bruising and gray skin. Thin skin, thin blood. He knots a rag around his leg and keeps rowing. Steady does it. Keep the rhythm and your body forgets the time and the tiredness. Without thought, he crosses the bay, across the bar, around the point up the beach, the route he's taken every day of his life. Darkness is nothing. Absence of form as familiar as its presence. He drags the boat up next to Tom's body. Sand gives way beneath his feet. Time, tiredness sweep over him. The ages all rush back. He falls back onto sand, lying full stretch beside the whale. He feels his heart fluttering in his chest, small enough to hold in one hand. How much blood through these veins? The sand crushes... The sand crushes warm beneath him, holding memories of past sunlight. He rests one hand on the killer whale, stroking the smoothness of its dark, dead skin. The last whale. No more. Their days of whale killing are done now. In the morning, he'll strip strip back old time, give his bones to a museum, lest they forget. He rests his hand on the killer whale's side and waits for dawn.